Boca Chica authorities confirmed that SpaceX wouldn't fly Starship on April 10th. SpaceX is developing the world's largest and most powerful rocket in the village located in Cameron County, Texas, and before its tests, local authorities issued road closure notices to stop people from accessing the highways and beach located close to the testing facility. A fresh notice was issued on April 5th, and while it does close the nearby locations, these are only for a ground test, indicating that more weight is needed before the 329-foot-tall rocket finally takes to the skies. In fact, Talk surrounding an orbital launch attempt from SpaceX has suddenly picked up the pace roughly two months after the firm successfully conducted static fire tests of the first stage Starship Super Heavy booster. Initial speculation boosted by placeholders from both NASA and the FAA hinted that a launch might take place as soon as on the 10th of April, but as we noted yesterday, while the two agencies had set a date, similar notices were missing from Cameron County. Well, this riddle has been solved later on as a fresh notice from County Judge Eddie Trevino Jr. orders the closure of Boca Chica Beach and Highway 4 on April 10th with backup dates available for April 11th and the 12th. However, while this is all well and good, the working of Judge Trevino's notice puts to rest any speculation of an orbital test flight as it notes, I have ordered the closure of Boca Chica Beach and Highway 4 for the purpose of protecting public health and safety during SpaceX non-flight testing activities on April 10th of 2023 in the time period between 8 a.m. CST to 8 p.m and in the alternative on April 11th of 2023 or April 12th of 2023 from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. of the same day. Should SpaceX not complete its planned non-flight testing on April 10th of 2023, then SpaceX may use the alternate dates to complete its testing activities. As made clear, the notice only closes the beach and the highway for non-flight testing activities, and it is careful to maintain this throughout the notice. This is only natural as SpaceX has not received a launch license from the FAA, which is necessary for the firm to conduct the test. On this front, rumors suggest that SpaceX SpaceX is facing a flurry of lawsuits should the FAA provide it with a launch license. These suits can delay a launch attempt, and as a result, the company is eager to keep the launch date secret and launch as soon as it receives regulatory clearance. Of course, all this is speculation, but environmental issues surrounding the Boca Chica Beach have been a thorny issue during Starship's development. The FAA's Operations Advisory continues to reserve testing dates for Starship with placeholders for NASA's observation aircraft also in place. However, the FAA has been quick to clarify that any mention of Starship on its advisory is not an indicator of a launch license approval, nor does it highlight that an approval is on the way. In the meantime, SpaceX is busy stacking and destacking its booster and upper stage spacecraft as it continues to run tests. Ship 24 was positioned and connected to the orbital launch integration tower chopsticks since Tuesday and yesterday lifted and mounted into place. Here we can see the ship quick disconnect umbilical arm moving while pausing the lift, and resuming again with the SpaceX team having a live view from this drone. Notably, after stacking Ship 24, they destacked it again, and stacked it one more time later on to make sure everything is perfectly positioned. Remember, we have possible closures next week from Monday, April 10th to Wednesday, April 12th from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Not for launch, but for non-flight testing activities. Moving over to the production site, Ship 28 is being stacked. Yeah, no matter how busy the first orbital flight is going to be, SpaceX hasn't left other things behind. The company's South Texas Starbase aims to build up to five of the two-stage mega rockets in 2023 alone. That means we could be witnessing the birth of a Starship with a serial number in the 30s as well as a Super Heavy booster in the 10s. Next up on today's update, over at NASA's Stennis Space Center, the RS-25 engine serial number 1001 test fired successfully for a duration of 500 seconds with a maximum of 113% power output. This hot fire was the fifth test in a series that began in early February to certify the production of the new RS-25 engines by lead contractor Aerojet Rocketdyne. 
The company is using advanced manufacturing techniques, such as 3D printing, to reduce the cost and time needed to build new engines for use on missions beginning with Artemis V. The fact that the RS-25 is both powerful and reliable is not in doubt. The engines were upgraded five times over the course of the shuttle program, during which time they participated in 135 missions, igniting across more than 3,000 starts, and remained powered over the course of 1 million seconds during both ground tests and flight operations. In total, NASA accumulated an inventory of 16 RS-25D engines from the shuttle program to support the first four SLS missions. Of these 16 engines, only two have ever gone to space. The space shuttle was equipped with three RS-25 engines, whereas SLS has four. Fueled by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, the four engines are arranged roughly in a square to ensure stability and equal distribution of force during liftoff. Each RS-25 engine can produce 2 million pounds of thrust, which combined with the two 5-segment solid rocket boosters will offer 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust at launch. During the shuttle era, the RS-25s operated at 104.5% of rated thrust, or around 491,000 pounds of vacuum thrust. But for SLS, these engines have been modified such that they'll operate at 109% of rated thrust, which is at 512,000 pounds vacuum thrust. As exciting as all this sounds, the price tag may simply be too high. Through its Artemis program, NASA is seeking a permanent and sustainable return to the moon. But for this to happen, NASA will need to rein in the soaring costs. For our last update in today's episode, a New Zealand company has started flying a rocket-powered space plane. This Mark II Aurora vehicle measures 4.5 meters long and is powered by a combustion rocket engine fueled by kerosene and hydrogen peroxide. During its initial flights, the vehicle flew to an altitude of about 1,800 meters and reached a maximum speed of about 315 kilometers per hour. It had completed the first three test flights of a rocket-powered space plane. The test campaign, which is taking place from the Glen Tanner Aerodome in New Zealand, will eventually see this vehicle top out at about 20 kilometers. The lessons learned from this plane will be put into a second version of the Mark II Aurora, which could take flight before the end of this year or early in 2024. In an interview, Don Aerospace Chief Executive Stefan Powell said this second vehicle will have a far lighter structure, a more powerful engine, and other features that would allow it to climb far higher. The goal is to fly the space plane to an altitude of 100 kilometers above the internationally recognized boundary of space, otherwise known as the Kármán line. It's only going to be capable of carrying a few kilograms of payload, he said, so you're not really launching anything. There's no second stage you can carry with 5 kilograms, but I do think that what's really unexplored is the suborbital market in this category. The Mark II Aurora takes off under the power of its single rocket engine, which is intended to fire up to an altitude of about 30 or 40 kilometers, after which the vehicle will coast up to about 100 kilometers before re-entering Earth's atmosphere. Atmosphere. The company is still assessing its options for protecting the space plane during the heating of atmospheric re-entry, but Powell said his engineering team believes they will be able to use high-temperature composite materials, which is consistent with the company's aim of flying often. We're certifying this as an aircraft, Powell said, so once we get our certification, we're allowed to fly as frequently as we want, provided we stay within the parameters of that certification. You know, we don't go to the regulator every time we want to fly, so that's one massive difference that facilitates rapid reusability. I'm sorry, was that a dig at SpaceX? Well, in any case, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and we'll see you next time.